Gray-haired woman sits outside in a wooden chair, a small weathered log cabin behind her. Title appears, voice of Gretchen Mead, great-granddaughter of James Cook. An atom is just a thing, unless it has its story. Um, so, so the analogy I was making is that you could have a really beautiful, wonderful old chair, but it's just a beautiful, wonderful old chair. If you don't have the story that went with it, if you didn't know that this chair actually belonged to, say, Marie Antoinette, then it's a whole different thing. It's not just a chair. I'll, I'll give you another example. One time when I was visiting my mother at the ranch, she pulled out an envelope from a chest of drawers, just an envelope, and in it was just a bit of lace. Well, if after she had died and I was going through the house and there was an envelope with a bit of lace, it's just a bit of lace. What's this? I, who knows if it would even have been kept. It's just, why does she have a bit of lace in an envelope? But what she told me was that this lace was, is a lace collar. And the lace collar belonged to Susan B. Anthony and was a gift from Susan B. Anthony to a member of my family. I immediately said, but you can't just leave it in an envelope. We will never know what it is. So she had it. She got photographs of everybody involved. She had it archivally framed and found the, the story that my great great grandmother had written about how it came into the family and I included all of that in an archival frame. And I have that. She wanted to make sure I had it. But now people will know what that bit of lace is and it will be because there's a story that goes with it. It's belonged to Susan B. Anthony. And so now it's something special and will be kept as opposed to just a bit of lace in an envelope. Why is that there? Black and white image of a sandy valley. Road ruts from a winding path and hills rise in the distance. Few trees. Title appears, voice of Gretchen and Mead, story of the cottonwood trees. Jim Cook first moved there. There was really just blowing sand, valley wall to valley wall. Instead of the wonderful hay meadows and lush grass that you find today. And there wasn't a tree not even the size of a knitting needle. There were, there were no trees. Uh, the reason it was blowing sand was the days of the buffalo were very, very recent. And, you know, they'll hang around the water sources as long as they can and then graze away from it and come back and then graze away from it. So that nothing has a chance to grow. And it's only until they have to travel too far to get back to water that they then move on to the next river, either to the north or to the south. Uh, Jim Cook, having been born and raised, at least in his early years in Michigan, really liked trees. And he knew the value of trees as windbreaks and help for the cattle for the when it was winter, and he just liked them. So he took horse, a team and a wagon and traveled south to the Platte River which is today about an hour's drive on a highway, and pulled up all the little cottonwood seedlings and saplings that he could find, brought them home and planted them. And he did this year after year, uh, keeping them watered because in that dry, harsh climate, if they're not, if they're not individually watered, they wouldn't have lived until he established this wonderful grove of cottonwoods, some of which are were probably planted in the early 1890 or late 1880s and are still alive. And from the opening photo reappears, now speaking. Title appears, Gretchen Mead, Story of the Greasy Grass Hide. The one object that I find of particular interest is a cow hide that always hung on the- She points to roof. Roof of the porch of the ranch house. Museum display of painted cow hide with Native American symbols. It is a painting of Custer's Last Stand by those people who actually participated in it. It tells the entire story of what happened in, in the Battle of the Little Big Horn of Custer's Last Stand from beginning to end. Since those were the people that were there, 
they know what happened. It was painted at the request of Jim Cook, who had initially asked them to please just tell him the story so he could write it down. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to paint it. So there are photographs of them painting that picture. And they would sit around it and discuss among themselves what was happened and what was the best way to depict it. And then they would paint that section of it. And then they would sit and discuss again and paint that section of it. And so it is a full picture of it. Woman from opening photo reappears now speaking. Title appears. Gretchen Mead, story of Red Cloud's portrait. Another thing that I find really interesting is a portrait that's painted of Red Cloud. And it's the only one that was ever painted of him from life. And again, the family have been asking him, we want to get your portrait painted. You're an important man. People in the future are going to need to know what you look like. And he wasn't interested. This wasn't part of their culture. But they kept asking. One day, when he was visiting, he showed up at the door, dressed in his best. Sends right arm and signals draping fringe with the left hand. Beaded. Raises right index finger and places next to head. Single feather and announced that he was ready to have his portrait painted. Didn't occur to him that you have to make a few arrangements ahead of time. You need canvas, paint, and a portrait artist. And he would never have come back. That was the one and only chance. And they happened, by the best of good fortune, to have canvas and paints and a portrait artist visiting. So immediately they sat him down and the portrait was, portrait was painted. A portrait of Red Cloud in tribal regalia, a single feather protrudes from behind his head. His head and shoulders are visible in the portrait. Return to video of the speaker. An elderly woman who had known him all of her life came into the house, saw it hanging in the, on the wall, shrieked, threw her skirts over her head. Demonstrates throwing of skirt with hands and points behind her. And scuttled into the hills, and it was hours before anybody was able to persuade her that it was safe to come back. She thought they somehow had hung her friend on their wall. It was, it would be horrifying for her, I'm sure. Here's voice of Gretchen Mead telling and learning of story. When I was a smallish child, I didn't actually get to the ranch anywhere near as often as I wanted to. I got there for a couple of weeks when I was seven or eight, and again when I was eight, and I think I stayed a month when I was nine, or maybe it was a different time that I stayed, but there are only three times, and the longest I was ever there was a month, and the other two times were just for two weeks. But while I was there, people would come to see the collections, and I always went with and followed and listened and asked my mother and asked my grandfather about things. So that at one point, I remember there were a few times when my mother was busy and I knew enough at that time that I did some conducting of visitors myself and told them about things. Now, I didn't know an awful lot about everything. So if they asked a question I didn't know, I, I had my mother to run and and, you know, and find out. But I do remember on a few occasions conducting visitors. But I do remember my mother telling me about them. I do remember, you know, my mother was a, a great storyteller. She would spend her life, she spent her life largely telling us the stories of her childhood and about her family. Uh, sometimes I thought ad nauseum and my eyes would kind of not really rolled in my head, but, oh, Lordy, but, you know, I didn't fully appreciate it when I was a child, but I heard them over and over. So many of them stuck. And then my mother wrote this wonderful book called Heart Bags and Handshakes, which is largely the story of the Cook Collection and how the collection came to be in the possession. 
and the story, individual stories of many of the objects in there, at least the ones that she thought were more important and more interesting. The previous black and white photo of a Sandy Valley reappears with title, Voice of Gretchen Mead Preserving Story. And what it felt like was wonderful. There's something about the place that runs deep into the soul of myself. A white image of a river oxbow behind Agate Springs Ranch House. The house, a stand of trees on the right, was furnished with what people would call today antique furniture. It was the furniture that Jim and Kate Cook had had. It was the furniture that Harold Cook and his wife Eleanor had, and it was just the furniture they had. And I, I took that for granted. What was wonderful about the contents of the house was what could be found <clears throat> on what is called the north porch, the vestibule, and the den. Two-story white house with a screened-in porch. The north porch was enclosed uh, just a few years after the house was built in 1892. And <clears throat> it has an external door and then a door into what we called the vestibule. The western third to a half somewhere in there of the north porch was a separate room. And in that room were big timbers of shelves and on them with the most marvelous assortment of rocks and fossils and interesting objects. Uh, these were things that my grandfather, Harold Cook, had brought in as things that he particularly liked. And that room was called the bone room. Floor to ceiling shelves holding bones, indigenous textiles below. And I loved going into the bone room and I absolutely adored being there with my grandfather who would point out the various things that were there and tell me about them. And I, I would listen to him in just absolute rapt attention because he was always so interesting in the way he told things. The rest of the North Porch was filled with Native American, mostly Sioux, but some Cheyenne gifts that had been given to the family from early, early years. Because shortly after Jim Cook went to live there, he contacted his Sioux and Cheyenne friends, whom he had had from long before he ever moved to the ranch, and invited them to come and visit, which they did. They came every some of them came at least every summer. Uh, sometimes there would be several groups of them coming. Would come in wagon loads of a few wagons to 10, 15, 20. One time there were 20 wagon loads that came to visit. visit they came with gifts. One man in indigenous regalia and another in ranch wear outside a large white house surrounded by men similarly dressed. Household, you know, hostess gifts, I guess you would, could call them, things that they'd specially made for the individuals who lived there. And as the family grew, my grandfather got married and they had their one, two, three, four daughters. There would be gifts for the children and gifts for the adults. And every single one of them, including the gifts for the children, were immediately removed from the person recipient and put on the wall and displayed and valued and taken care of. And if a story had come along with them, that story was preserved and written down. And so this collection of uh, artifacts, which also were in the vestibule and in the room that we called the den at that time. Image of den at Agate Springs Ranch, desk in corner of room, objects are displayed on wall. Two rugs featuring indigenous motif adorn the floor. There came to be more and more and more. And the Native Americans, when they came to visit, observed this is what happens when we bring things. They are valued. They are put on display if there's, the story is remembered and they're taken care of. These are really appreciated. And this turned out to be important as the years passed and more years passed after everybody had been on the reservation for years. Um, it turned out that as the elders, and, and I, these are the men and women who had lived portions of their adult life prior to living on reservations and who knew how to live without white men around. 
as these older people started to, to die and their, off, their children who had never lived anywhere but on the reservation did what often happens today uh, when the parent dies, if you don't have room or need for something, you know, you don't keep everything the parent has. You kind of just keep a few things maybe and the rest gets, is gone. The result was that very little, if any, of the, the objects that these people had kept to remind them their, their, their special objects they had kept from before they were living on reservations, these weren't being kept. They were being gotten rid of, or destroyed, or just they weren't valued as as, they, as the elders would have hoped. Because you understand that the way of life that they had always had was they knew was gone forever, and they knew that the knowledge of how to live that life roaming on the prairies was going to go with them because their young ones couldn't roam on the prairies with them. They couldn't show them. They were confined to reservations. And if the objects themselves were gone, it's as if they, somehow they, they were gone altogether as a people. But they recognized that if they brought things to the cooks, they were valued, they were honored, they were kept, they were preserved, that there was a story story was kept and preserved and honored. And so at this point, when this, when it became not just an unfortunate happenstance when one elder died, but this was kind of the standard thing that happened, then they started bringing their special objects, they started bringing their heirlooms, and it shifted from just hostess gifts, just, you can understand in quotation marks, because some of them were absolutely glorious but it shifted to those things that were of special importance to them. It shifted to those things that were their heirlooms, things that had belonged to their grandfathers or their maybe their great grandfathers and things that had particular significance, such as the war club that American horse used in the, the Fetterman massacre. Things that were really important to them. They brought them and gave them and that is how the collection turned into this wonderful, wonderful representation of not just scalps and war clubs and peace pipes and uh, those things, but... Large egg-shaped gray stone attached to stick with brown strap. The everyday things, arrow straighteners and the hide scrapers and just the things they used in their everyday life. So it was really, really representational of the whole of what they did it had. Genus leather tunic with feathers, fringe, and three green crosses near the collar. And what they would say when they would bring these gifts is that... Long leather bags with fringe and indigenous beaded designs. Your children's... You'll remember the stories. And your children's children will tell our children's children the stories. They can come and see them. They will still exist. And... Your children's children can tell our children's children, and they will know the stories. And that was what was done. The collections became a real attraction, possibly more for white people than for native. Each leather pouch uh, labeled to Jay Cook from Standing Bear. Three wooden objects lay to the left side. People came all the time and to ask for uh, tours through the collections. My mother has written and told me that when she was a child, it was not that unusual on a weekend for every member of the family to be conducting a separate group of people through the collections. And they had to kind of space themselves so that, you know, what, what, what one person was showing and telling would not interfere with what somebody else was showing and telling. Miller fringe textile with colorful beaded design. So that it was... This responsibility of caring for and telling the stories was has always been very much honored by our family. 